Hello my soccer universe, another international break is upon us and while the action on the field will be without doubt uh, be quite interesting and on that a little bit uh, later, uh, it also comes on the back of major announcements by UEFA and FIFA for the hosts of the next three tournaments after Euro 24 and uh, the World Cup in 2026. So we know all the next five tournament hosts which I think is pretty big, but also a teeny bit controversial, I would say, and also has interesting stuff in there. We have six nations hosting the next World Cup, and we have seven nations hosting the two Euros after it, which is a whole lot more than we would expect, and that's where we're going to start. Let's talk first about the hosts of Euro 28 and 32. I think they're a little bit less contentious once you think about it, although at first, yeah, we have seven nations all behind me and uh, they're gonna host two tournaments but there's a caveat in that that actually makes it quite interesting it's also um i think a good way of doing sports politics without really causing too much trouble although the in the end the choice for italy and turkey to together uh from a purely geographical and travel sense or uh, does not make a whole lot of sense there will be uh, big trips in there but you have to see how 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 this pans out now how did this all come into place? Well, uh, Turkey, who has been bidding for the Euros for a long time already. I think they wanted to go for Euro 2016. They were uh, the favorites for 2020, where they ended up hosting nothing. Uh, 24, they lost out to Germany. And they were given, you know, the UK uh, plus Ireland bid was always going to be a tough opponent for Turkey, Turkey, especially with the quality of stadiums that the UK have. And you know, it all comes down to money. You need to have really nice stadiums to host it because that's what they like, all the business suits and so on, hospitality pack, pack packages. This is where the money is at and this is what the UK delivers in spades. So that was always gonna be a tough opposition and then running against Italy might also be really tough for Turkey to get in because if Italy get their, you know what, together, this might be a better bit than what Turkey can uh, potentially live up for. However, Italy also indicated that it might be really hard to get more than five stadiums together. And I can totally see that this, it hurts so much to say this because we're talking about one of the greatest footballing nations on earth in Italy. But their stadium infrastructure is atrocious. And yes, we have a stadium in Turin, we have a stadium in Udine. Uh, at, the, at the moment, I think Cagliari is still building one. And so, so there are some projects going, but especially when I think about Fiorentina, where their owner tries to build a new, new stadium because the stadium is a listed uh, entity, cannot get it ready. How uh, Roma has already, I think, twice or three times announced a new stadium and not even a single stone has been laid for such a stadium. It is really, really atrocious what's happening in Italy there. Um, I'm curious how quickly Milan can get their stadium together. They are talking about in 2028 to have a 60 or 70,000 see the stadium uh and it seems to be all going uh swiftly but you know italian bureaucracy will always be hard so italy said more than five stadiums might be push, 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 pushing it and then uefa said you know why don't you guys combine the bid we give 28 to uh, uh england we give a third 32 to you and turkey and we avoid a bidding war and so in a way everyone's a winner again i at first, when you look at the UK bit, there are five confederations who will qualify. We'll talk about that in, in a sec. And the other one uh, with the two, uh, Turkey and Italy, two, two, two together. I mean, there's always the question who will host the final. I would assume Italy, but I can also see Tur Turkey, but it's a point of geography. However, then, you know, the history buff of me says, we you know, we had this period in time where there was West Rome, which was Rome, and East Rome, which is now what now? Istanbul, Byzantium first. And so on, Constantinople, Byzantium, is Istanbul. So I can see that you can actually um, brand this well. And as of late, there have been actually, you know, just on a full football terms, some good. Uh, they are, I, I think they're both very fervent footballing cultures. I think overall, I can get on board, and they're all kind of in the Mediterranean. Now, it would, personally, I think uh, what would be great is to throw Greece in there as well. But that's a whole other story. But at least what will not be a problem for uh, the 32 uh, hosts is who will qualify because Italy and Turkey will qualify. 
that will be a little bit more interesting for 28 because UEFA stipulates that there can only be two host nations can have uh, receive automatic bids which I uh, uh, only learned recently and I think that's actually not, uh, not the best stipulation. Now the way it's gonna happen is that all five teams will enter qualification and then they will see who will actually qualify and then there will be two spots reserved for the two other teams that do not qual uh, for two other teams that have not qualified based on their ranking. So basically you have to qualify for your home tour tournament, which I think is fair in, in a way. Given the status of the home nation, I mean, Scotland at the moment is doing right, uh, rather well. Um, and, you know, I can, the other three, it's usually that uh, two to three have qual qualified uh, as of late for the expanded tournament. I think it was always the, uh, at least three of them. So uh, it might be that we get all five host nations, but I would say only England is definitely a shoe in. But yeah. We have to see, but I'm actually happy with that form for, format. I, in my short video, I had some reservations about England because you know uh, what we had at Euro 2020 with all the trouble there. But then, tell me any big European final as of late in a major city that didn't have a problem. I'm thinking Paris also. Uh, so I guess learnings will have to be made. I think it will be great. The bid is of course heavily focused on England with six stadiums in five cities there. Most notably for me is that neither are that two of the most hallowed grounds are not in there, meaning Anfield and Old Trafford. Uh, it's the new Everton Stadium and uh, the uh, Etihad that are actually included in the bid, which I find another interesting feature. And now let's get to Infantino's big announcement of the 30 World Cup being hosted by Six Nations on three continents and to be honest it is the kind of decision that appeases everyone everyone everyone's a winner no one's really a loser that's how it is brand marked and i guess the reality of it that yeah this was probably the best way of making a decision pro portugal and spain and morocco by not by avoiding the real fiasco that we had with the Olympics in uh, 96 when it were given to Atlanta, again, the money, instead of Athens, who then hosted the Olympics eight years later, who were great Olympics, actually, as far as I do remember. But, I mean, my first reaction was, uh, why is it so big? But then, honestly, the next World Cup will also be huge on three continents. But also, it is not a good sign of the times because there's a whole lot of travel involved when you have those games in South America and then the rest, albeit in a much closer area. I actually have less problem with this, these three countries hosting the World Cup because they are neighboring countries. It's, it's kind of combined two, two together and I think the stadium infrastructure actually in all three of these are actually really, really good. So much less problem there, but I think the message that it sends that we have three games in South America to open the tournament. And then we have all this travel back and forth uh, from the Southern Hemisphere to the Northern Hemisphere, just uh, in terms of carbon footprint and so on. It's a really, really bad message that FIFA is sending there. Really, really, really bad. And I think this is what uh, annoys me the most. It also does annoy me that, you know, Everyone would have understood. Yes, the next World Cup is in the Americas. But everyone has to if the 2030 would have also been given to the Americas. This would have been this nice feel-good story. Yes, it is coming back where it really started in Uruguay. And then we have, of course, Uruguay alone cannot host the World Cup. So we throw in Argentina, who are a world power. We throw in Paraguay, seat of common ball. And I guess this is why they're still in, in there. I think there was Colombia in there as well, which I didn't quite understood, uh, understand. I think Chile would have a little bit made more sense. However, the reality is that I cannot see South America hosting such a huge tournament. Yes, fervent support, great states, this is the stadiums, but I don't think the money is there. Realistically, there are only three confederations that can host a World Cup where FIFA's bottom line will not be affected all that much. 
and also of course the hosts in 26 so of course Europe where you probably can choose widely and it's of course Asia and what this decision also did is and FIFA more or less said is because if a confederation hosted the World Cup and hosting three games means hosting the World Cup which I find rather embarrassing to be honest but yeah South America is hosting another World Cup if I was South American, I would be really pissed off uh, uh, about that. But um, what, what is also awesome is we have now a uh, common ball out for 30 and 34. We have UEFA uh, hosting a 30, so they're also out for 34. We have the same thing for Africa. We have the same thing for uh, South America. So the only ones they can host are Asia and Oceania. And there's a reason why I put Saudi Arabia up there because they already sell so something that they will be hosting. And this is just opening it up for Saudi Arabia, who also wanted to host. We know there was this beat Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Greece, which uh, had a little bit of a charm, I have to admit. But I was not much in favor of uh, it's Saudi Arabia, who desperately wants to host Saudi Arabia. They want to do it Qatar. They want to do it, we'll do it 12 years later. Because let's see what are the other options in Asia. Uh, China, I don't think that China will go for it at the, at the moment. Although they're, they're, that's the only other nation that I can see. I don't think that, although they hosted a great Women's World Cup, I don't think that Australia and New Zealand combined can get the infrastructure together that is required. Because uh, they will not build like crazy. And for me, it's always uh, a little bit um, of a mindfuck that... Uh, for me, it's always astonishing of, while we think of Australia, you know, the big cities, Sydney and Melbourne, how little big stadiums they actually have. And that also has, has, has been the same thing goes for New Zealand. So um, cannot see that. So I think we know that the 34 World Cup will be for sure in Saudi Arabia. However, I think it might be expanded in the larger area as well, because I think Saudi Arabia will also come to the conclusion that we don't have that many cities and it doesn't make sense to have that many stadiums. Maybe we'll include a few neighboring nations there as well, but that remains to be seen. It has to be all Saudi funded in a way, but I can see that the Emirates throw their weight in there as well. As I said, I personally have no problem with the uh, World Cup if it was just hosted by these three nations. I think this makes a whole lot of sense. Um, I think Spain is one of the few nations on this earth where you're spoiled for choice. The big uh, news coming out of Africa was that the final should be hosted in Casablanca. I just cannot see it really when you have a Bernabeu just remodeled and so modern and so spiffy and so on that you would uh, give away that. But maybe they will, will be draw. It will be pretty clear. One of these three uh, nations will host the final and the other two will get the semi final. That's what I can there that, that, that I see. I think Port, Port Portugal will probably throw in uh, the two stadiums in Lisbon. Will probably throw in uh, one in Porto. I would uh, say one in Braga probably. Um, I can see probably each nation having four to six stadiums and so on. And will be a fine World, World Cup that makes sense. Lastly, I want to say I think the World Cup has become, meanwhile, so big that I actually think what UEFA did in, uh, in 2020 slash 21 uh, to give a World Cup to a confederation instead of a federation might make actually more and more sense to say. I would actually say you could, kind of could make a rotational scheme in, in a way. Again, we have CONMEBOL, we have CAF, we have OFC uh, confe uh, confederations that probably will not be able to uh, manage to host a World Cup uh, meeting FIFA standards, although I really would love to see a, um, a World Cup hosted in Africa again. Yes, it is in Morocco, uh, but you know, on a larger con con continent in, in a way. Um, that might, might, might be a problem, but you know, you could at least make it okay. This tournament is hosted by the AFC. This tournament is hosted by UEFA and then you pick stadiums there uh, which also would allow smaller nations to be able to host the world cup and expand it there for a little bit more because i could see that an all over europe world cup actually could work if you make it reasonable don't don't do it you know you, you say okay 
This time we go a little bit more in the northern corner of Europe, or we go a little bit more, or we focus on the southeastern, you know, make quad quadrants and, and, and so on, um, but allow other nations to host as, as, as well, especially nations that haven't hosted the World Cup before. Now going back to Euro qualifying, uh, it has to be said that ahead of this tournament there are many nations that have players missing due to injuries or injuries because you know uh, there are major club games coming up as well you know the Champions League is going into its I'm not say final but in a very much decisive phase with the double rounds we have uh, big matches in the leagues come, come coming up I mean there's El Clasico there are major uh, clashes in Italy uh, as well happening and then of course England it's always so major fixtures coming up there and there are some players reeling and the clubs don't want to really uh, how do I say? They do their best to not have the players available, although I don't want to doubt that uh, most of them have big injuries. However, let's run at least through the clashes for the next three uh, days where I pick out the most interesting ones uh, and I'll show you then the other ones as, as well to round out all the games for the international break. So with the matches starting today, uh, the first one that should be on your radar is Albania against the Czech Republic. Those, this is a top clash in Group E. Albania have been the surprise. Both teams are poised to qualify at the moment, uh, with Poland lagging behind. Uh, the Czechs also have a game in hand. Um, if Albania win that one, they're more or less qualified. Uh, but I think both probably can live with a draw potentially as well. Although, you know, you never know. Poland is not too far off. So... That, that's anyway. Croatia Turkey is another top clash, this time in Group D. However, both are relatively comfortable. Yes, Wales can get in there as well, and Croatia have a game in hand. And then the little matter Spain Scotland, another top clash. Um, Spain will want to have revenge. I am pretty sure that Spain will want to have revenge after losing to Scotland away from home, but Scotland have a spotless record so far. I think both of these teams will go through from this, 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 this group. Scotland get a draw. I think they more or less are secured of their ticket and Spain will qualify anyway. We would also have an interesting one between Israel and Switzerland, but because of recent horrif horrific political events, that one has, to be, has been postponed for November the 15th. It will be rather, rather tight because Israel at the moment definitely cannot host uh, any, any games. The big one on Friday for me, Austria against Bel uh, Belgium. It doesn't really matter. It's again a top clash between two nations that more or less have qualified. This is for first place and that actually could matters because uh, whoever gets first place and has a good record has a good chance of making it pot one. So uh, that might be an additional consideration here. Austria have many, many, many players injured, many players injured and missing. So I'm not sure what to make of this one. Well, no, 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 they can hold of Belgium. Uh, nominal, the big ones, of course, Netherlands against France, another top of the table clash. Um, Given whatever happens between Ireland and Greece, it may not matter. I mean, if Ireland beat Greece, then whatever happens, the Netherlands will not fall uh, too much behind. So that might not take too much. Uh, Portugal, Slovakia is also one top clash again. We have many, many top 1v2 ma ma matchups. The problem is that I think Slovakia would even count with a loss here and they still would uh, qualify rather easily from this group. Although getting something out of, out of Portugal wouldn't be too bad. Then uh, the Saturday action, um, Slovenia, Finland, Denmark, Kazakhstan. I think that's that's the most important because this is the tightest group. Those four teams are all within a point with Slovenia sitting top ahead of Denmark, ahead of Finland, ahead of Kazakhstan. Whatever happens there will go a long way. And then with Hungary, Serbia, again, two teams that are sitting rather uh, comfy on the top of the table with Montenegro a little bit lurking in the background. But I think also those two teams are going through. Uh, Ukraine, North Macedonia is basically who will challenge uh, Italy. I think not more than that. Then I give you also the clashes for the rounds after. I mean, we have Norway, Spain. I'm not sure if this will have any implications. Wales, Croatia could be in Israel because Wales got a point. Uh, Austria could potentially clinch already with a win in Azerbaijan, although it might not be easy. Uh, 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 Belgium, Sweden depending on what happened in Vienna. Greece against Netherlands, I think a win for the Netherlands will see them through. Pretty sorry, so, so, so certain about that. And then we ended with another classic England against Italy. Um, 
probably for first place, which we should go to England anyway, the way things have been going. And then the little meta, you know, against Slovenia, then Denmark, uh, Finland, Kazakhstan, all important there. Survey so against Montenegro also sounds fun. So, kind of a longer introduction to the international uh, break video, but I think there were so many things happening that was worth talking about all of these. Please drop a line below what you thought about all that. Give me a thumbs up if you enjoyed this video, subscribe to my channel, we'll see more. Talk to you soon. Bye. Hey there, I really hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, here are some videos and playlists that you may enjoy too. Also, please consider subscribing to my channel and hit the little bell icon so you get notified whenever something happens in my soccer universe. And with that, have a wonderful day. Bye.